Tonight's subject is imagination plus faith. Imagination plus faith are the reality out of which man fashions his world. What do I mean by imagination? I mean God. Man is all imagination. And God is man. And exists in us. And we in him. The eternal body of man is the imagination. And that is God himself. The divine body, Jesus. We are his members. It's entirely up to us what we imagine. But it's imagination plus faith. For we are told without faith it is impossible to please him. Now, I can tell you tonight that your own wonderful human imagination is God. I can't convince you that it is. I ask you to try it, I ask you to test it, but I can't persuade you to the point of conviction. You have to become self-persuaded through experience. So here, any bold assertion on my part will really not convince you, but I am hopeful that imagination is the sole cause of the phenomena of life. If perchance you hear the word God, the word Lord, the word Jesus Christ, and it conveys the sense of some existent something outside of your own wonderful human imagination, you have a false Lord, a false God, and a false Jesus Christ. If you really know who you really are, that your own wonderful human imagination is God, you cannot fail in achieving your objective. All things are possible to him who believes. With God, all things are possible. Now, he equates man with God. I just quoted from the ninth of Mark and the 19th of Matthew. In Mark it's man. All things are possible to him who believes. In Matthew he tells a story. Tells the rich young man to go sell everything. If you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, sell it all. And follow me. And then he disheartened because he had so many things, so many possessions. And then he said it's easier for the camel to enter through the door, through the needle's eye, than a rich man to enter heaven. And then the disciples said, well then who can be saved? He said, with men it is impossible, but with God all things are possible. With men who do not know who they are. That's what he means. With men who do not know the Lord's name. Those who know thy name put their trust in thee. For thou, O Lord, would not forsake those who seek thee. If I know his name. Now let us look for his name as revealed in scripture. And Moses said to God, if I go to the Israelites, and I say to them that the God of your forefathers has sent me to you. And they say to me, what is his name? What shall I say? And God said to Moses, say, I am. That is who I am. Just say, I am, has sent you. For that is my name forever, and by this name I shall be known throughout all generations. I have no other name. Just be aware.
to be aware is to say, I am. Without uttering one sound, just to be aware. That is I am. That is God. Now that's what I mean by imagination. Now what is faith? We are told in the 11th chapter of Hebrews that faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. By faith we understand that the world was created by the word of God. That things which are seen were made out of things which do not appear. And without faith it is impossible to please him. He calls a thing that is not seen as though it were, and the unseen becomes seen. Now, having found who God is, my own wonderful human imagination, then how will I go about actually creating something that at the moment seems either difficult or even impossible? I start, first of all, naturally with God. Well, God is my own wonderful human imagination. So the most blessed gift in the world is a strong, vivid imagination, a clear idea, and a determinate vision of things as I would like them to be, all within my own mind. Conjure a scene which would imply the fulfillment of my dream. See it clearly in my mind's eye. Give it all the tones of reality. Give it as much sensory vividness as I can. And believe in that imaginal act. Have it so fixed in my mind that I am completely oblivious to all the things round about me that would deny it. And walk in the assumption that it is so. Assume that feeling that the wish fulfills and simply ignore everything that denies it and walk in it. And I'm calling a thing that is not now seen as though it were seen. And that unseen state will become seen. I tell you, I know this from my own experience. It never fails, but we are the offering power. Knowing what to do is one thing, and doing it is another. So will I do it? To know it all well and good, but will I do it? Those who know thy name put their trust in thee. In any other God, it's a false God. To turn to any other God, you're turning to a false God. He is housed within you, as you're told in Scripture. Do you not realize that Jesus Christ is in you? Examine yourselves to see whether you are holding to the faith. Test yourself. Well now, I can test you right now, this very moment. In fact, I've already given you the test. And you be the judge as to whether you failed or passed. I use the word God. I use the word Lord. I use the word Jesus Christ. If your mind jumped on the outside to something other than your own wonderful human imagination, you failed the test. Do you not realize that Jesus Christ is in you? Or if in any way, and no matter how you try to excuse it, the mind goes out to some image on the outside, no matter how beautiful it is, how altogether wonderful it is. If it goes out, you fail the test. So we are told, examine yourselves to see whether you are holding to the faith. Now he tells you what it is. Do you not realize that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. Now, it may be a shock to the whole vast world, but I cannot avoid telling the story. I've experienced it. I can only share with you what I know. And I'm telling you that if you dare to assume the feeling of the wish fulfilled, 
knowing who is doing it. It's God doing it. For God is your own wonderful human imagination. And he is doing it. If you dare to assume it and you walk in the assumption that it is so, ignoring the senses, ignoring the facts of life that deny it, in a way you do not know, it will become a reality in your world. This is what I mean by imagination plus faith. But these are the realities out of which we fashion our world. Take a man who is drafted. I was drafted in 1942 at the age of 38. Not quite 38, but going on 38. Like millions of us, I dare say they all felt as I did, but they didn't know this principle. I knew I didn't want any part of it. Nevertheless, I was drafted. I didn't resist it. They sent me off to Camp Hope, Louisiana. And after three months in boot training, I decided I would do something about it by applying this principle. I asked, first of all, for an honorable discharge because there was a regulation that came down from Washington. But if a man was over 38, before March the 1st of 1943, he was eligible. It didn't say it was automatic. If his commanding officer felt that he needed him in his company, that decision was final with the commanding officer. You could not appeal it to any higher position. You couldn't take it to the general. So whatever your commanding officer was, and he was a colonel, if he decided he needed you in his battalion, you remain. Well, I applied based upon the fact that I was eligible, or I was 38 before March the 1st of 1943. And it came back to me disapproved and signed by my commanding officer. All right, that seems final, but there is nothing final in this world if you know who God is. If you know that your own wonderful human imagination is God, you do not accept anything on the outside that is in conflict with your wonderful desire. So I desire to be honorably discharged out of the army and doing the work I'm doing now, for I did it before. I want to return to that work. So that night, here was the paper that I received that day, disapproved and signed Colonel Theodore Bilbo Jr. His father was Senator Bilbo of Mississippi. As I retired in my barracks with all these men around me, I assumed I was in my own apartment in New York City. I knew it well. I left a wife and a little girl only a few months old when I was drafted. My son volunteered and he was with the Marines in Guadalcanal. And they picked me up and I was drafted and my little girl was born the end of June of that year. So she was only a few months and I had a wife and a little girl. And so I imagine, I am home. My wife is in that bed, I'm in this bed. And my little girl is over there in the crib. And then I simply assume I'm walking through the apartment. It was a nice seven-room apartment. And I walked from room to room and touched the objects, and they all seemed so familiar. And I looked through the window, and I saw Washington Square. And I looked to my right, and I saw Sixth Avenue. And then, having gone all through the place, I simply returned to my bed and settled in it all in my imagination. But I gave it the tones of reality. I gave it sensory vividness. I made it so real that it seemed to me I'm actually in my apartment in New York City. But I made quite sure I was not there on furlough. I was there because I was honorably discharged. No furlough, not going back. Well, four o'clock in the morning, before my eyes came, a sheet of paper. It looked 
like the sheet that I got from the colonel, where it was disapproved. And as I looked at it, a hand came out from her to the pen and held a pen. And it scratched out the word disapproved. And it wrote both the script approved. And then the boy said to me, that which I have done, I have done. Do nothing. I wrote, and all the boys were sung to sleep. I remained because I couldn't break their sleep. I remained until that very moment when I could go down and shave and clean before anyone else did, which I did. And this thing is permeating my entire brain, what happened to me that night. For nine days, I did nothing. On the ninth day, the same colonel called me in. And after a long chat with me, he said, go back to your commanding officer, captain, and tell him to sign another application. And so I went back. I had done nothing in the interval. And he signed another application. I went back to the colonel. The colonel approved it. And that very day, I was on a train from Camp Hope, Louisiana, to New York City, on a deep discharge. To this day, none of them knew or know what I did. I did it all in my imagination. I believe that what I did was fact. I believe that my imaginal act creates facts. And therefore, I actually lived in my apartment, and I was not any longer a soldier, I was a civilian, but I was honorably discharged from the army, not dishonorable. And in nine days, it was fulfilled. I can multiply that story by hundreds, if one will actually do it, for we are the opulent power. Instead of doing strange things and getting in wrong with the government and fighting for your objectives, you don't fight at all. The boy said to me, that which I have done, I have done, do nothing. Well, where was that voice? Within me. That very voice that I heard coming from without was whispering from within me. The voice that said to Moses, I am. That is who I am. And he heard us coming from without what is being whispered from within. For are we not told in Scripture that we are the temple of the living God and the Spirit of God dwells in us? And God is Spirit. Well, if the Spirit of God dwells in us, then how could I hear it from another? He is coming from within myself. And so I heard it. When I could not get any passage, I did the same thing. When I seemingly was locked in an island for months to come, because there was no strength, no ships coming, I did the same thing. I remember what I did in the army to get out. I did it when I was in an island and could not get out. And then a long, long list waiting, and they called me and gave me passage for my wife and my little girl and myself. And yet there were thousands waiting all through the Indies to get out and only two little ships servicing the entire group of islands. And I simply got out. It doesn't matter how, I did it normally. I didn't kill anyone, I didn't bribe anyone, I didn't pull any strings, I simply applied this principle. If I actually got passing, would I sail? Yes. Well, then I assume that I am on a ship. And looking back nostalgically at the little island, leaving behind me my friends and my relatives, and taking with me my wife and my daughter. And I looked back and it seemed so normal and so natural. I gave it tones of reality. I could feel the source of the sea on the rail as I held the rail of the ship. I could smell the rawness of the ocean. And I could see the island. And then, within a matter of 24 hours after I did it, I got a call from the Altor Steamship Company to come on down and see them. I went down, and they said, we have a passage for you. There are only two beds, but the little girl can sleep with her mother, and you can sleep up. 
And so there were two bunks on a lovely ship, small, only carrying 60 odd passengers, but I sailed and came back on time as I was committed to go to, to uh, Milwaukee the 1st of May. And I got there, got there in time. So I asked everyone to believe in God. But God is not something on the outside of you. God is your own wonderful human imagination. If you have any other God, you have a false God. Therefore, do not feed him anything but loving thoughts. Nothing but loving thoughts. Always exercise your imagination lovingly on behalf of everyone in this world. It doesn't cost you anything, and it doesn't hurt anyone. And you will find yourself becoming the man that you want to be, the lady that you want to be. And you'll move from stage to stage to stage without hurting anyone, and fulfilling all of your dreams then you'll know how true the statement is. That all things are possible to him who believes. Because with God, all things are possible. And you'll fund God. You'll fund him in yourself as your own wonderful human imagination. That is God. As stated so clearly in Scripture. We call in Scripture the potter. And the word potter means imagination. I go down to the potter's house to see how he does it. And he was working at, a, at his instrument. And there he was at a field making a something out of clay. But what he had, the vessel he had in his hand, was spoiled. And he reworked it into another vessel, as it seemed good to him to do. He didn't destroy it, he didn't discard it, he reworked it into another vessel. So you don't discard anyone. You work. See him as you would like to be seen by the world. See him in a more noble light. So you rework him in your own imagination. And believe in what you've done. And he will conform to it. So you don't discard anyone as something that cannot be a remedy, that cannot be made right in this world. You make him right in your own mind's eye. For the potter is your own wonderful human imagination. And any vessel you hold, whether it be a man or yourself, see that it is lovely, that you are actually the man that you want to be, that those round about you there are what they would like to be, and have a nice vivid imagination of it, a clear idea of what you really want in this world, and a determinate vision of things as they ought to be, and have them all fixed in your own mind's eye, and believe it then in a way that no one knows, they will all come to pass. They will not fail you. You do not need any background to apply this principle. If you have no social, financial, intellectual, or any other background, it does not matter. You do not need them. It's nice to have them, no question about it. But many of us were born without these qualifications. I know I was. I have no social, intellectual, or financial background. None whatsoever. Born in a small little island of a very poor white family. A large family of nine boys and one girl. Her, my father and mother, found it naturally difficult to keep a family of that size clothed and school. So my schooling was limited. We always had enough food to eat. But we ate, well, whatever the island provided. Sweet potatoes, rice, yam, fish. So we had enough, but certainly not a variety of things. And then I left the island when I was 17. 17 years and 6 months. And came to this country. Uneducated. And therefore they said to me, well, you can't get a job. And to a certain place, I offered myself to string wires on the telephone pole. And they said, you're not qualified. I said, well, what? I'm strong, I'm young and healthy and strong, and I'm quite capable of doing it. No, you haven't the educational background for it. So, I finally found a job at J.C. Penney. That was nothing more than a good busboy. What's going on here? A 
feedback? Am I closing it here? I know nothing of it, you know. I can't. I can't. Well, well, if I stand back, would it help? Well, I'm sorry, I apologize to those who are annoyed by it. Lower them down, would that help? Well, try anything. Any better? All right. So here what I'm trying to persuade you to do is to follow Scripture. Scripture is the greatest book in the world, and it teaches you, and it tells you, it invites you, and encourages you to exercise your imagination lovingly on behalf of anything in this world, and that you cannot fail in achieving the goal that you seek in this world. If you know who you are, praying to an external God is not going to help you at all. There is no external God. God actually, literally, became man, that man may become God. He isn't pretending that he is man, knowing all along that he is not. He literally became man, and completely emptied himself of the divine power and took upon himself the limitations and the constriction of man. And finding himself man, he now is subject to all the weaknesses of man. But in the end, he discovers and remembers who he is. And then, as man remembers who he is, he shares that memory with his brothers who have not yet remembered who they are. For we are all one, and there is only one God. All one God buried in this fragmented state called humanity. And so I'm telling you that tonight, and it will not take you long, if you know exactly what you want in this world, and you're willing to assume that you have it, and speak tonight as though it were true, and make a mental image of friends round about you, congratulating you on your good fortune. And you see them in that act, and you accept it. You don't make any excuses about it. You accept it as fact before it is seen by the world. The Catholic Bible translates this statement best of all, as far as I'm concerned. It's the 17th verse of the fourth chapter of Romans. And they say, God calls things that are not seen as though they were, and the unseen become seen. The Protestant Bible, both King James and the Revised Standard Version, they say he calls into existence the things that do not exist. That I question. To me, all things exist. All things exist in the human imagination, but I need not call them into being. I can select the one that I want to call into being. So I cannot say I call into existence the things that do not exist, because they do exist, but they're unseen by mortal eye. So I call it into being. Now, these unseen things are states of consciousness, and all states exist. They exist now. You and I are travelers, and we travel through states, as a pilgrim travels through cities, and he leaves behind him the city. But the city remains, and he goes on. So I travel through states. I can travel through the state of poverty. Poverty remains for anyone to enter it. But having shared it for a while, I didn't like it. And so I moved out of the state called poverty. But I don't destroy the state. The state is there for everyone to enter if he wants to enter. He can feel sorry for himself, and then in no time that he finds himself in a state he doesn't like. But he can see it as a state <coughs> and he thinks, what's wrong with me? He's only in a state. Don't condemn the man for the state that he's in. It's the state. And you can't kill the state or destroy the state. The state is there as a permanent fixture of the universe. But you can move him out of the state. Represent him to yourself as the man that he would like to be. 
and see him as that man in your own mind's eye. And you will take him out of that state. The state will remain for anyone, either willingly or unwillingly, to enter that state. So we're all moving through states. And the pilgrim simply moves and moves from state to state. When you find that you can go where you want to, it's not the privilege of the rich, it's the privilege of the man who can imagine. I had no power to pull to get myself out of the army. I didn't need wealth. I didn't need any background. I, all I needed was the memory that I am he. Let we still know I am God. Are we not told that in the 46th Psalm? The 10th verse? Be still and know that I am God. Man, you, you can't be. You can't be that arrogant. All right. Well, if you happen to be that arrogant, well, then remain where you are. Remain in the little state. Perfectly all right. Because the state doesn't care how long you occupy it. You can occupy it from the cradle to the grave. And it doesn't care. But while you're in the state, you're going to illuminate that state and you're going to reap the fruit of that state. But knowing that there are states, select a more desirable state and then you enter that state. Well, how do I enter the state? It's all a move. Did not Churchill tell us that the mood determines the fortunes of people rather than the fortunes determine the mood? He knew what he's talking about. The fortunes are not determining the mood. The mood determines the fortunes of people rather than the mood Determine the for that the fortune determine the mood. I will assume the feeling. I assume the feeling of the wish fulfilled. And then it was Anthony Eden who told us an assumption, your thoughts, if persisted in, will harden into fact. And you can't deny the men, both the prime ministers of England. Churchill was the great prime minister during the war years, and Anthony Eden followed him after he was ousted. And when the Conservative Party came back into power, it was Anthony Eaton who was the Prime Minister. And I've just quoted these two Prime Ministers. And a third Prime Minister, which is the great Benjamin Disraeli. He said, man is not the victim of circumstances. Circumstances are created by man. So it's entirely up to me. If I know the state, infinite state, so I enter this state, or that state, or the other. And I simply enter a state by a mood. That's all I need to do. What would the feeling be like if it were true? Well, then I contemplate the thing, and then what would it be like if it were true? And if I dare to assume that it is true, that's my way to success. The feeling of the wish fulfills the stain is man's road to success. So tonight, be mobile and don't limit it by your present state, for that's only a state. You, the occupant of the present state, are equal with every being in this world, for it's only God. And the occupant of that state is God. So one who has a billion today, he is in a state of fabulous wealth. But he, the occupant, is the same being that you are, is God. There's nothing but God. And the one who is enjoying great health, and the one who is now not enjoying health, they're still the same being. And so, what would it be like if, and then you ask the simple question and catch the mood. So as you catch the mood, then the fortune follows. We're always believing ahead of our evidence. Don't wait for evidence. You precede the evidence by your belief. And the belief is caught by a mood. What would it be like if it were true? So imagination plus faith are the realities out of which we fashion our world. And without faith, it is impossible to please it. That's what we are told in the sixth verse of the eleventh chapter of Hebrews. All these marvelous things are taught us in Scripture, but man doesn't see it correctly. He sees it as secular history, and it isn't secular history. The whole thing is salvation history. The whole thing is all about God. And God became man that man may become God. So he's actually seated here in everyone who is seated here. And you say, I am, that's God. There is no other God. 
When you hear the word God tomorrow, or you hear the word Jesus, or you hear the word Lord, don't fail in your test and let the mind jump on the outside to something other than yourself. For what the God spoken of in Scripture is your own wonderful human imagination. That's God. There isn't a thing in this world that you see now as a fact that was not first imagined. You name it, name one. It was all first imagined. Now you may say, well, the tree. I didn't bring that in. Yes, divine imagining. In the depths of your own being you did. On the surface you can see all the things that you do. That the clothes you wear, they had first to be imagined. The very building in which we are now housed, it had to be imagined. All these preceded the evidence that came into the world. But if you go beyond that and say, well, after all, the stones were not, and the trees were not, yes, they were. They were all imagined in the depth of your own being, but now you came to the surface in these garments, and you can see the evidence of what man imagines in the world. He had first to imagine going to the moon before he could conceive the means to get to the moon. And you and I have to imagine everything in this world before it can become a fact in this world. For there is no thing that you and I will call a fact that was not first imagined. So objective reality is solely produced through imagining. And you can start now to imagine a more noble world for your own self and for your immediate circle. You don't have to go into the whole vast world, your immediate circle. A more noble, more lovely thing that you want to experience in this world. And if you imagine it and believe it, that what you have imagined is fact, it will become a fact. But I tell you, imagining creates reality. Because God, imagining, is creating. And man, imagining, is God. And so he is created. Now look at the world and see what we have done with it. Because we did not know what we were doing. The morning's paper will show you the most horrible things in the world. And that's all man's imagination. It need not be. But we have felt it morning, noon, and night because man has not controlled his own wonderful human imagination. When he does, he will have well, heaven and earth. So, if I could now summarize it for you, the God of whom I speak is the human imagination. And all he uses with that is faith. And faith is simply the subjective appropriation of the objective hope. And that's an easy thing to do. You simply appropriate it subjectively. What would the feeling be like if it were true? That's a subjective appropriation of my objective hope. I want to get out of the army. Well, if I were out, I would not live Camp Hope. I hear what I be. I will leave my home on Washington Square in New York City. Well, then get there. But how do I get there? There I am in Camp Hope. Well, you go there in the only reality that there is, your imagination. So in my imagination, I assume I am in my place in New York City. And then I thought of Ken Pope, and I saw it 2,000 miles to the south of me, where I was, not where I am. For I am in New York City. So in thinking of Ken Pope, I saw it away down, away down south in Louisiana. And then I view the world from that state. And having viewed it from, I fell asleep. And falling asleep, here came an internal voice telling me, that which I have done, I have done, do nothing. And it actually scratched out, disapproved, and wrote in, approved. And that all came from within me. For a dream, if you call it a dream, is egocentric. So the whole thing has to take place within me. And I'm only sharing with you what I actually have experienced. And then, in nine days, I'm on my way. For the vision had its own appointed hour. It ripened in nine days, and then it flowered. And I came into the colonel's presence, he shook my hand, I went off and I got my money, that was due me, 
went to the place and bought my ticket and off to New York City. He was a nice gentleman. Now, I should not argue with that man. I did not try to persuade him outwardly. I did nothing, as the boy said to me. I didn't raise a finger to argue why I should be out of the army. He disapproved. And the law said you cannot take it to any higher position. Your commanding officer is final. His decision is final. I could not take it to the divisional commander, only my battalion commander. And yet I was out. And I didn't violate any rule. I simply went through the rules of Caesar. And he himself had a change of heart. And he doesn't know why he had a change of heart. He had to. He had to, or the whole army would have to, after I did what I did. And then the voice came and affirmed it. Because when vision breaks into speech, the presence of God is affirmed. And here is vision now. I see the hand, I see the paper, I see the pen, and here is the action. Approved. And then comes the voice. So the vision broke into speech. And there is the affirmation of the presence of God. As told us in the third chapter of the book of Exodus. And he saw the burning, burning bush. And then the bush began to speak. And so here was the vision. Accompanied with word. And when vision breaks into speech, the presence of deity is affirmed. So I tell you, it will happen to you too. And you will know who you really are. That the Jesus of the Bible, the most glorious concept of the world, but it's reality. It's not any myth, it's true. But where is it? He's buried in man. Man is the sepulchre in which he is buried. He's buried in your own skull. And out of your own skull one day, he will rise. But when he rises, you are he. He will awaken within you. There won't be another. There won't be another. It's you. Because you're all imagination. And you do not observe imagination as you do objects. You are the reality that is named imagination. So you don't observe it as another. You are that reality. But all that is said of him, you're going to experience in a first person, present thing, experience. And then you'll know who he really is. When he rises in you as you, you'll know who Jesus is. And he can say, he who sees me sees the Father. Then you know who the Father is. And then you'll know who the Son is. You'll know who the Son who calls his Father which is not taught in our churches to this day. For the son who will call you father will be David of biblical faith. He will call you father. He will call you my God and the rock of my salvation. And you will know it is true. There is no uncertainty as to this relationship between you and this son who will call you father. And then you'll know who you are. For he is the Son of God. As taught us in the Bible. I will tell of the decree of the Lord. He said unto me, Thou art my Son. Today I have begotten thee. These are the words of David. And David in the Spirit will call you my Father. And then you will know who you are. You will know God. Because no one in the world can convince you that you are God. But his son calling you father. I can tell you from now to the end of time that you are God. But not to convince you. I can hope to persuade you. And loosen your thoughts somewhat. But I can't actually convince you that it's true. Until... His son, David, stands in your presence and calls you father. And you know it. No uncertainty as to this relationship. And then and only then will you know who you are.
That's why we are told in Scripture. No one knows who the Son is except the Father. And no one knows who the Father is except the Son. And anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. So when the Son chooses to reveal you, then you know who you are. So your own wonderful human imagination is the God of Scripture. And God, using only faith, creates his world. And because he is how evil, your own wonderful human imagination, using only faith, can create the world in which you would like to live. Now let us go into the silence.